So after I graduated from college and moved back to DC, like any underemployed liberal arts major, I decided to focus my time and energy on finding love. Now, the first thing I did as part of this plan was join a co-ed soccer team, as you do when you're looking for love. <laughs> and a couple of months in, this plan was not a success. Um, most of the passes my teammates made were actual passes. <laughs> and even that didn't happen very often because of the patriarchy. <laughs> And one night I was playing and I was running down the center of the field and I noticed a cross was coming in from the side and I, it was coming right towards me and I was like, oh my God, this is my chance. Like, I'll kick this ball, I'll score a goal, um, I'll finally prove myself as a soccer player and a go some guy on the team will finally notice me and he'll be like, she's a really good soccer player. Maybe she should be my girlfriend. <laughs> So I get the ball, I hit it one touch, and it sails off my foot, and for a moment, I know it's a goal. And then it hits a defender's shin, ricochets up, and hits me in the face. <laughs> and the vision in one eye instantly goes dark. So I rush to the emergency room, I see the resident ophthalmologist, and as he's checking out my eye, he's asking me like where I'm from and what I do. And at the time, I was a temp at NPR, and my only task was to edit um, old web copy for a new website, but really all that was was deleting Oxford commas. <laughs> so I tell him, you know, they call me the serial comma killer. <laughs> and he laughs in a way that indicates, A, he sets a very low bar for puns, <laughs> And B, he knows what a serial comma is. And somewhere through a haze of fear and a concussion, I think, he likes grammar too. <laughs> nice. Um, so my eye doctor tells me that um, my eye is seriously injured. The reason I can't see is because it's filling up with blood and the pupil's been obscured. So while it heals, I'll have to wear an eye patch. <laughs> I'll have to go on bed rest, and I'll have to come in every day for daily checkups because if anything goes wrong, I could go blind permanently. Um, so I'd come in every day, and he would say something like, you know, I listened to NPR on my drive in. I don't know that how they've stayed open so long without you. And we'd laugh because we both knew I wasn't important. <laughs> And it was during these daily appointments that I started to notice that my eye doctor was figuratively and literally a sight for sore eyes. <laughs> and not only that, <laughs> but through offhand comments and internet research, I learned we had a lot in common. <laughs> like, he grew up in Maryland, I grew up in DC, Based on graduation dates, they estimated his age to be from 28 to 31. I was 22, which is also an age. <laughs> Before going to med school, he taught high school. Around that same time, I attended high school as a student. He was a doctor, I was a hypochondriac. We just made sense. And at the time, I had these very indulgent roommates, and every night over dinner, we would discuss the subtext of that day's appointment. So I would say something like, you know, I think my eye doctor likes me because he always asks me how I'm feeling. <laughs> or he wants to know when he's gonna see me again. And like, Sometimes, like, we don't even have to talk. We can just gaze deeply into each other's eyes. <laughs> now, what my roommate should have said was, that's because he's your eye doctor. <laughs> but instead, what they said was, of course he likes you. We think you're great. We love you. My roommates were also my parents. <laughs> So that went on for several weeks, and 
I start to think like maybe that crossed soccer ball wasn't my chance to impress the soccer guys. Maybe it was my chance to meet my eye doctor. Maybe the ball that blinded me was actually Cupid's arrow. Maybe this is my destiny. <laughs> So um, as the last, my last appointment approached and it became time to say goodbye to my eye doctor forever, I decided that instead I would ask him out. And I brainstormed this plan with a lot of people, friends, family members, roommates, and <laughs> we came up with a bunch of ideas. Um, an early idea was that during my last vision test, I should just say, sorry doc, all I can see is you and I. Um, and while that plan had flair and did appeal to my doctor's appreciation of bad puns, it ultimately had to be rejected because that sentence is grammatically unsound. <laughs> and grammar is kind of like our thing. So what we settled on was that after my last appointment, I would hand him a business card and say, since you're not my doctor anymore, and then just sort of waltz out with the implication hanging in the air, <laughs> which had the advantage of minimizing the window for an in-person rejection. <laughs> so the day of the appointment arrives, I borrow a dress from my youngest roommate sister. Um, <laughs> It's a little too short and a little too tight because she's 14 and I'm an adult. Um, but the important thing is it has pockets into which I've put the business card. And I arrive at my appointment and Dr. Wilson, the attending doctor, is there with my doctor boyfriend, which is not a part of the plan. And Dr. Wilson goes on to explain that there was permanent damage to my eye which is really not a part of the plan. And as she's explaining this, like I start panicking a little bit and I'm like, oh my God, like if I go back to playing soccer, I'll have to wear rec specs, so I'll never meet anyone that way. <laughs> and like my pupils could stay two different sizes and facial symmetry, something we subconsciously look for in a mate, like I have damaged goods, I'll never find love. This is my only chance. <laughs> and she stops talking and leaves the room. And my doctor fiance looks at me and he <laughs> says, do you need me to explain that again? So he does. And as he's explaining it, I reach my hand into my pocket and I start turning the card over and over. And as I'm doing this, a thought hits me for the first time. And it's that this plan is really inappropriate. <laughs> like, I think this qualifies as workplace harassment which is upsetting because always when I pictured harassment in the workplace, I thought I'd be the victim, not the perpetrator. <laughs> and then I think, well, like, I don't have to go through with this. And then I'm like, no, I've told too many people. Like, I wrote a letter to my grandma. <laughs> and I realize that when he stops talking, I'm going to have to execute this plan that I'm losing confidence in by the minute. And suddenly, like, the room feels very hot, and the dress that was just a little too tight is very constricting, and it's getting harder to breathe. And I look up, and my doctor husband has stopped talking. <laughs> and I reach into my pocket for the card, and I faint. No. I pass out, and when I wake up, the room is full of people. Dr. Wilson's back, and she's like, lifting up my legs to get blood to my head and I'm trying to like f like check my pocket for the card and also like keep the skirt that's a little bit too short from flying up and she notices this and she's like Dr. Goodman get behind her don't worry I won't let him get fresh with you and I'm just like I wish he would get fresh with me and so they wheel me to the emergency room the doctors run all sorts of tests um, my parents show up and they're like, so, like, did you do it? <laughs> no, I fainted. And the doctors come back. They can't, uh, the tests are all negative because there's nothing wrong with me physically. <laughs> <laughs> and my parents take me back to the family group house. <laughs> and after that, I never saw the hot doctor again. Aww. I know. Um, I did go back to playing soccer. I do have to wear rec specs, which I found very primitive, but very effective form of birth control. <laughs> so I haven't met anyone that way, but I'm keeping my good eye open. <laughs>